Listen, we, the, today we've been listening to all sorts of new ways to try to have fun, you know, but I think we shouldn't forget the old faithfuls. I went to see the Beach Boys when they were here recently in Hong Kong on their 50th anniversary tour. Can you imagine that? 50 years. These guys, they're now in the 70s, but uh, they still, they got a lot of energy. And two, it, they took two and a half hours. I think they played 100 different songs. I think I recognized almost every single one of them. Their version of fun is California Girls, Good Vibrations, Serving in the USA. That's what they're thinking. But I'm thinking that fun, you know, it, it, it needs to involve something more than just momentary fun. It, for me, I have the most fun when I get some meaningful satisfaction out of life, deep, uh, deep enjoyment. I'm Dave Sutherland. I read a book, and they said any speaker should start their talk by trying to connect with the audience to show them that they're just, they're just a regular guy just like everybody else. You know, I wish I could do that. I'd like to be a normal guy, but I'm just not. My life is completely unbalanced. I, uh, you just ask my wife. I am focused on things to the point of insanity. My malady started when I was very young. I, in high school, I was an academic debater. It sounds exciting already, doesn't it? I was there in high school. I was working 40 hours a week on preparing for debate competitions. Then I went to university, and it got, things got completely out of hand. I was spending 100 hours every week getting ready for debates. I know, that was kind of crazy, but it worked out for me. At the end of my first year of university, I came in second place in the nation for the freshmen throughout the country, and uh, through the years, we won a number of big debate tournaments. My junior year, we came in third place in the country, but it all came to a head in my senior year last year, and in 1982, we won the National Debate Championship in the United States. And I can prove that's true, because this is our Wikipedia site to prove it. <laughs> So after seven years of incredible nonstop in, uh, effort, it was incredible to accomplish what we had worked so hard to achieve. That was really incredible fun. At the time, I thought that winning the national championship would be the most important moment of my life, that that would be the point at which I had distinguished myself from all the other people in my life. But soon I went on to real life as a lawyer, and I, the glow started to wear off. And in my office, the partners in our law firm, they didn't really care what I had done with the spare time when I was in university. And over the years, the, me the memory of that championship has kind of faded farther and farther and farther away. You know, I think many of us, we spend a lot of hu huge amount of effort trying to accomplish certain goals. We want to become managing director. We want to become a recording artist. We want to build a great game. We, we want to make the most money, whatever it is. But basically, whenever anyone actually achieves that goal, almost all of them eventually realize that that achievement that was very important to them is not enough for fulfillment. That if you want real fun, you want real enjoyment, there has to be something else. Now, most people only learn this lesson later in life when they've achieved something big. I, I was a little bit unusual because I had an accomplishment early in life, which was really important to me at an early age. And, and that experience taught me to refocus my priorities onto significance instead of success. So at the age of uh, the mature age of 26, my wife and I, we sat down to plan out the course for our lives and decide which areas were most important to us. I have to tell you, Deanna and I, were committed Christians, and uh, we believe that God has called those of us who have been g given great privileges to give back to those who are less fortunate. And uh, God's been gracious to us. We've got a lot of failings that uh, God puts up with, and he's still gracious to us, and so we want to be uh, gracious, uh, we want to be grateful. And also, during my debate years, I learned that I think that the number one issue that faces the world is global poverty. It afflicts billions of people. There is no other issue in our world that comes even close. So as we thought about this, my wife and I, we kind of married these two ideas together. We prayed. We decided that we wanted to be involved in the fight against global poverty in our lives. And when we made that decision, we, uh, it didn't really take a lot of research to, to determine that there are far more poor people that live in Asia than really in any other part of the world, so that we decided that Hong Kong would be the best place for, start, for us to run our lives. From here, we could balance professional goals against our desire to help the poorest people in the world. But first, I decided I wanted to get a few years of U.S. experience, start our family before we launched our lives in Asia. So I began my career in Washington, D.C., working for Arthur Anderson, then to went to work for Wall Street law firms. Then I went to work for the Clinton administration for a few years. But during that time, we never forgot our desire to, want to, be, to live in Asia and to focus on poverty. So in 1997, Morgan Stanley offered me a job in Hong Kong. Now, we were a little skeptical about working for an investment bank, but we really wanted to live in this continent, so took the job. I always said that I won't sell my soul, but I might rent it for a little while. 
Now, I'm pleased to say that my initial concerns about working for an investment bank for Morgan Stanley were uh, really far, uh, far unfounded. It has been a great company, a great place to work. And over the last 15 years, I've been able to rise through the ranks of the organization. Now I'm the chief financial officer for Morgan Stanley across all of Asia. It's a multi-billion dollar business. And, uh, but Deanna and I have also been able to get involved in poverty issues. More than a decade ago, we discovered a small charity called International Care Ministries. Back then, ICM's entire budget was about 70000 U.S. dollars a year. I became the chair of, the bo- of ICM's board. We uh, built a team. We're now running one of the biggest charities in the whole of the Philippines. We're almost 100-fold bigger than we were when we started. We're now running about $6 million U.S. dollars a year. We're growing from there. It's been a wild ride, and it has been a massive amount of fun. Over the last few years, we've been able to care and feed for about 300,000 ultra-poor people, bringing life-changing education and values, health, and livelihood. We've made a difference in the lives of more than 15% of all of the ultra-poor people that live in the provinces that we work in. And our business plan projects that in the next 10 years, we want to saturate the entire southern half of the Philippines. Our intention is to change millions of lives. It's a huge commitment for us. I was in the Philippines 16 times last year, never on Morgan Stanley business. And every time I go, I meet another ultra-poor person whose life has been revolutionized by ICM. Now, how could you possibly have more fun than that? All right, enough about me. I want to tell you about some of my Filipino friends. In particular, I want to tell you a story about Grizel. Grizel is eight years old. She lives in a rural area outside of Bacolod in the Philippines with her parents and her six siblings. Her father works when he can, but the family has to survive on about 30 U.S. cents per person per day, and they often go to bed hungry. The stakes with poverty can be life and death. A few years ago, Krizel's sister died needlessly. No access to medical care there. Their home is made from scrap materials with little sanitation. Life is hard where they live. It's very hard. Then an extraordinary thing happened to Krizel. ICM invited her to participate in our Hong Kong banquet. Every year what we do is we gather about a thousand of our brother in the convention center here and we ask a few of our Filipino participants to come here and explain a little bit of how ICM has affected their lives. So we asked Krizel, would you come and and show our donors how children in the slums play drums and how they do it there? And she was really obviously excited about that opportunity. So for three months she practiced and prepared, did lots of stuff. And last month, just one month ago, she traveled here to Hong Kong. And when she got here, for the first time in her life, she saw running water. She felt air conditioning for the first time. She played with toys that uh, Hong Kong kids play with. She saw that life in Hong Kong is easier than where she comes from. It's a lot easier here. Finally, she appeared on stage at the ICM banquet. She was very poised. She did a fantastic job. Now, that was one month ago she did that. Krizel now has returned back to her hometown, and she's back where she started. This photo was taken the day before yesterday, less than 48 hours ago. And now all the ICM excitement is over, and there's no more trips to exotic places in her future. So how do you think she feels? Now, you might wonder, uh, maybe she's depressed because she's discovered how wonderful life could be if she lived in Hong Kong, and now she realizes how much she's missing, and she wouldn't have known that if we hadn't brought her here. But if you ask that question, it shows that you think that we live here in the real world and that there are a few people like Frizzell who are disadvantaged and they suffer those because they can't experience our normal lives. But that is not what Frizzell believes. For her, life in rural Bacolod is normal. She thinks that you and I, we live in Disneyland. And she was thrilled to be able to visit all of us here in our storybook land for just a few days. For Frizzell, it was a great experience, a fantastic memory. So let me ask you this question. Whose perspective is more accurate? Is our world actually the norm and Krizel is in the minority? Or is it true that Krizel lives as most people do and that there are just a few of us here in this room, people like us that live in luxury? Now, when I ask it that way, you know what the answer is, right? If you were able to step back from uh, and see the whole world objectively, you would discover that there are more than 5 billion people in our world who live on less than 10 U.S. dollars a day. That is about $3,500 U.S. dollars for an entire year. That is 80% of every person on this planet. More than 3 billion people, 50% of all humans, they live on less than $2.50 a day, less than 1,000 U.S. dollars for an entire year. And more than 1.5 billion people, 25% of all humans, they live on less than $1.25 a day. That is less than 500 U.S. dollars for an entire year. That means that one quarter of everyone on this planet lives for an entire year on less than the cost of one dozen tickets to this TED event today. 
that sort of that sort of numbers they give you a new perspective on our world, doesn't it? So it's easy to understand why Grisel believes that she's in the real world, right? Our worlds worlds are very very different. You and I live inside the gate to Disneyland. Grisel lives outside the gate. Now, how do those worlds compare? Of course, there are great benefits to living inside the gate in the first world. Most of us have plenty of food to eat. We have a, fi- a safe place to sleep. Listen, we have the bandwidth to focus on our careers. We can raise a family, and we can also think about innovative ways to have fun. Last week, Deanna and I had a great time at a villa in Cota Kinabalu. Our friends went off to Macau to see the House of Dancing Water Show. Today, we're hearing fantastic speakers talk about you know, climbing mountains, computer games, fashion design, mobile apps, many more technologies. The future of fun. When you live inside the gate, there's a lot of opportunity for, di- for distractions. But we also need to recognize the pitfalls of where we live. Inside the gate, we run hectic, harried lives. We go to war in our business world, sometimes leaving a path of broken and injured people. We breathe polluted skies. Some of our kids feel that the world owes them a good job, and they really shouldn't have to work very hard in order to get ahead. But Grisel's world, it's outside the gate. Almost everything about her world is different than ours. Grisel doesn't own a watch. She doesn't even know anyone that owns a watch. She has genuine fun playing with her friends. Not all fun requires electronic toys. The Molinas, they have deep family bonds. She has a real sense of belonging. Many of us would love to live in a place, a world where we felt accepted for who we are. People outside the gate, they do not sit around all day, every day, moping about their problems in total despair. Quite the contrary. If you walked into a Filipino slum village, you would find dozens of kids who want to come meet with you. And virtually all of them would be smiling and laughing. It is hard to find any place in our world where there is so much pure joy. So then what is the problem then with living outside the gate? I think we can all agree that Krizel's core problem is not that she does not have an iPad. Krizel's core problem is that she lacks some basic human needs. Krizel often goes to bed hungry, and she is not alone. At ICM, we survey tens of thousands of our participants. 27% of them say that they go to bed hungry at least once every week. In comparison, inside the gate, I've been on a strict diet for the last few months. This is a photo of my diet food. Looks yummy, doesn't it? But uh, listen, I've lost 26 pounds, 12 kilos in the last two months. That's a real accomplishment. My doctor says that it's really important to my health. It isn't really easy for me to say no to the limitless supply of junk food that's available to me. Grisel's family, she walks 500 meters to get impure water. Trips back and forth to the well are incredibly debilitating for their family. Now, again, this is common outside the gate. A third of all of ICM's participants do not have access to water within 50 meters of their home. On the other hand, inside the gate where I live, I have no trouble with access to water, but I've got this hot water heater in our shower that keeps bouncing on and bouncing off. It leaves me either scalding or frozen, and very, it's very frustrating. You know, I can't just wish it away. i still got to deal with it. Grisel's older sister, she doesn't have enough money to go to school. In Hong Kong, we're losing expats because there aren't enough private schools. Now, listen. Don't misunderstand me. I do not mean to belittle the problems of the first world that we live, our problems inside the gate. Our needs are real. But it is fair to say that our world, both inside the gate as opposed to outside the gate, these are very, very different places. Now, where does that leave us? There are a lot of differences in the future of fun, both inside and outside the gates, but the core elements of fun, they are similar across cultures. My wife, Deanna, helped me sort this out. So I want to give you two elements to Deanna's formula for fun. With these two ideas, you can have fun even if you're not married to me. (laughs) First, Deanna says that everyone wants to leave their fingerprint in the world. Some want to create a business and leave a future generation. Parents want to raise their kids so that they can uh, have a piece of themselves that lives on. All of us want to leave a legacy. So you, you need ambition. You need drive to make your dreams happen. You need fire in the belly. Second, Deanna it says that you need skills to meet your objectives. So that's easy, right? There's the formula. Fire in the belly plus skills. That equals fun. That's really all you need to know. So how does that work out for us inside the gate? First, we need to identify our dreams, and we need to embrace them with gusto. We need a sense of urgency. When I was involved with debate, I, uh, I threw myself into that act- activity 100%. And without a big level of commitment, then you're really unlikely to find meaningful fun. I strongly recommend that the dream that you develop should involve helping other people. 
And secondly, you need to understand what skills you need to accomplish your dream, and you need to make it happen. So with debate, I pursued every option I could think of to hone my craft. I, I learned to speak quickly. I don't know if any of you have noticed that. But uh, for your quest, maybe you need some sort of skills training. Maybe you need counseling. Maybe you need to build a team of people around you that have skills that you don't have. But you need to develop understanding. And you should consider this formula if you're seeking fun, meaningful enjoyment, whether you're coaching your kids' sports team or organizing events for your coworkers or investing your efforts in charity. Deanna's formula will help you put structure around your search for fun. And how does that play out for people outside the gate, people like Krizel? It's the same two elements. First, they, have the motivation to make diff- they need to have the motivation to make a difference in their lives. They need hope. People in poverty, they have no trouble trying to find momentary amusement, but meaningful enjoyment, that is often beyond their reach. This is important. Imagine what it would be like if you had to live hand to mouth. Every morning you wake up with only a few pesos in your pocket if you're lucky. If you don't earn some money this morning, then you don't eat breakfast, literally. If you earn some money in the morning time, then maybe you can buy lunch, maybe dinner. If you don't earn money that day, then you don't eat that day. For many people in poverty, lack of food happens not every day, but it happens several times a week. It is normal to go without meals. It's not unexpected. But not every day is a disaster. Maybe you have a windfall one day and you can earn some extra income because your overseas relative sends you a little money or you get a little better than expected job. And we would expect that if somebody had a windfall like that, they get a little extra cash, then they would put it in their pocket. They would give them a cushion to be able to eat every day for the next little while. But the poor do not do that. They physically have no way to save. There aren't any banks where they live. If they keep their extra funds in their pockets, it could be lost or it could be stolen. Or if their neighbors find out they have money, then the neighbors will have um, an immediate financial crisis. So whenever an ultra-poor person earns anything above the absolute minimum, they spend it almost immediately. That's why if you walk through very, very poor communities, you can sometimes see old televisions in the homes of these houses with children that are hungry. There was a day that they had a windfall and they, they spent it on the television. Now, before you judge them too quickly, remember that they are malnourished. Their mother was malnourished. Their children are malnourished. They fully expect their grandchildren to be malnourished. They've seen people promise that if they follow this plan or that plan, that their lives will change. But as far as they can tell, nothing ever changes in their world. Poverty is just as rampant as before. These people have no hope for tomorrow. They live in a cloud of despair. These people, they need to develop forward thinking. They need to understand that what they do today will benefit what they experience tomorrow. To have fun, to have meaning, they need hope. Second, the people in poverty, they need, uh, they need to know the fundamentals. They need to develop skills to earn income, to keep their kids in school, and to improve their health. And they need to develop those skills within their own worldview. Too many outsiders assume that people that are in the third world, that they live the same way we do in the first world, that they, we learn through lectures and textbooks. But people in poverty are semi-literate, and they, uh, and, uh, they uh, learn through stories. They're oral learners. They need nonprofits to design their curricula around oral learning styles. We in, when we insist those in poverty, we need to operate within their worldview so that we can communicate to them in ways that they decipher. So that's the secret. The Beach Boys had it right all along. It was fun, fun, fun. And I am living proof. As Deanna's formula is working for me, I need to confess that there are lots of difficulties and experiences in working with the ultra poor. My experience with ICM has been filled with a lot of stressful and very busy days, a lot. But without hesitation, I can tell you that my days are also filled with fun. And the most fun about this whole deal comes from the results, seeing lives change. Our surveys show that after ICM's four-month training program that there's an 85% reduction in physical abuse in the homes. There's a 22% reduction in serious illness. There's a 61% increase in household income. That is really fun. Finally, back to Krizel. When she was in Hong Kong, Krizel was able to go to Ocean Park. She rode the cable car. She went to the frog hopper. She loved the aquarium. And she even dared to ride a roller coaster. Now, for all of you in this room, you can do this. Fun is not just temporary pleasure. It can be long-term and it can be satisfying. Fun does not have to be a selfish thing. Your fun can bring powerful change to lives that are all around you. Isn't it extraordinary that we have the opportunity to bring fun, fun, fun to people both inside and outside the gate and to create fun for both of us at the same time? Thanks very much.